everyone. I uh, run a research centre in London at uh, Ravensbourne University London. And we're looking at all sorts of different technologies that enhance learning, creativity, but it's not just digital technology. And I'm going to run through a whole range of augmentation technologies, immersive technologies, but the caveat is technology will not save us. I think we're all familiar with this, this massive information overload that we're all suffering from. So how do we combat this kind of stuff? And how do we combat this kind of stuff where we're boxed in? If you think about virtual reality, it's, like a, it's boxing us in even more um, than our mobile phones are. And we've got to really get, it, get this right, because interface design is crucial, um, because we see the zombification of the world all around us. And we need to make changes. We're absolutely um, critically you know, at a stage in humanity where we need to um, get our technology right so that it can help us rather than hinder us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between humanism, transhumanism, and then posthumanism or hyperhumanism. And I'm going to talk about it in, the ter in terms of intelligence augmentation. So just a reminder for what humanism is, Humanism emphasizes the value and agency of human beings, either individually or collectively. Transhumanism is all about human enhancement. But humans are the most important species in this movement. But transhumanism is always intelligently used, um, but it can lead to posthumanism. It can lead to, to hyperhumanism if done correctly. So let's look at some examples of uh, transhumanism. So I think one of the critical things is, is context going forward. We are, you know, we're, we're lacking in context. When you put a VR headset on, you're only experiencing vision or sound, but you're not experiencing the rest of the senses. You're not experiencing much of the context, of your usual context. So is that an augmented reality, or is it a diminished reality? And I'd, I'd argue that it's, we're diminishing our realities with the current use of these immersive technologies. A typical example of this that I like to show is that of a game called Bloodsport, where you're a gaming, you're doing a, you know, a shoot 'em up game in Oculus Rift, um, but actually you're also linked to a uh, drip. And blood, every time you get shot in the game, real blood is taken from your body, and you, um, it's, it's last man standing wins. Fabulous. So all the all the gamers. All the gamers love it, and why it's really, really decent um, is, is that all the blood is donated to the blood bank. So everyone's a winner. Um, but more seriously, how are we going to look at things like the refugee crisis? How are we going to get more context in that situation? If you're just having a visual situation, a visual uh, experience of somebody's plight, it's voyeurism. It's not helping. It's, it's, you need more of the, you need to be invested much more. So the other point is that we only experience 1% of the visual spectrum. We only, only experience 1% of the auditory spectrum. So how can we break out, break out of these prisons of perception? And Robert Anton Wilson's got a, a good point here. Our perceptions are always gambles. We believe what we see, and then we believe our interpretation of it. We don't even know we are making an interpretation most of the time. We think this is reality. And I'm going to show you lots of different realities and the fact that we can make an infinite number of them. So I've worn this for a week. It's a 360 vision device. So it takes a street view camera. It squashes that 360 view into 180 degrees. And your brain only takes 15 minutes to adjust to seeing in that, that new visual system. So imagine, I mean, I, I have people throw things at me from behind. So I'll catch a ball here because I can see it coming. So I've worn this for a week. And it's almost like the brain says, well, thanks very much. Why didn't you do this before? So imagine what happens to fashion, imagine what happens to sport when we suddenly have this new visual system. But we cannot just limit ourselves to vision, we can have new aud auditory systems. This is context engineering. So it's, it's not the idea of, of having infinite amount of content that's actually a big problem for us because we've got a massive resources problem. We can change the way we perceive the content that already exists by creating tools that change our perception as the content. And I'm going to show you a load of examples of that. This is the Hear One Active Listening system. So you put these earbuds in. It enables you to context engineer your sound environment. So you can remove certain parts of your sound environment, like that annoying noise on the airplane, or a baby crying, which you shouldn't do, by the way, um, or somebody snoring. 
And the rest of the sound environment remains the same. So changing the way you hear individually, again, creating this very narrow or very expanded reality tunnel. This is the aroma fork. Um, where you're able to combine taste and smell in entirely new ways to create a whole new range of experience. So I'm trying to show you a whole different range of stuff that affects all the senses, and then we'll talk about creating new senses. Um, this artist doesn't think that we're going to evolve into, into, into robots. He thinks we're going to devolve into animals, and he's already practicing to become a goat. <laughs> so this idea of context engineering, it's... It's all about doing things like this. So taking one context, an entire context, and putting it inside another one. So taking a nursing home and putting it inside um, a preschool, or vice versa. And it affects both contexts you know, massively. And actually, these old people are massively invigorated by the young people around them. Let's mix it up. Or this, an artist in China who's able to context engineer how she appears to the world just by using convex and concave mirrors. So I'm not just talking about digital technology, and I think that's the mistake that we've made, that we need to think of everything as technology, language. You know, we, our humanity itself has actually derived because we use technology. So this is a little uh, primer on mixed reality. Um, this is from 2007, George Klein's work at Oxford University. And this basically just shows you how it works. So this is the early experiments for, for getting the edges of objects. And what we're doing now with these technologies is creating 3D models of the world. And then we can attach any digital content to that space. So just think about that. So these, these algorithms actually create the objects of the world. So you're not, in the future, going to be taking 2D pictures. You're going to be taking 3D models of everything your headset, your contact lenses, will make 3D models of everything you're seeing automatically. So this is a project we've just finished. We, we won 3 million euros uh, to create this project looking at mixed reality solutions for um, Industry 4.0. So training people in context, annotating space. And you saw there at the beginning of that, um, the, the, the airplane. So that's what, if you go into a HoloLens or a Magic Leap, you see that the room is scanned you see that you create a 3D model of everything around you, and then you can augment the digital layer on top of it because of that 3D model. So this is typically what you can do. You can make, create mirror worlds. So you can actually have um, you know, a copy of the world. It's great for interior design if you want to look at what your house is going to look like. Uh, architects get very annoyed because they think they should have the artistic vision, but actually the, now the, the customer just infinitely changes everything. Uh, thanks to these sorts of technologies. Um, and I've, I mentioned contact lenses. So this is what's coming. Five, five years' time, you'll have augmented reality directly in your eyes. Is it going to be safe? Who knows? <laughs> um, but what you'll be able to do with it is um, this sort of thing. So you know, I, I put a, this simulation on, and I was literally, I looked around, and I was in, everyone was in The Simpsons. So think about that. So you won't just be able to choose what you wear. You'll also be able to choose how you see, what filter. You think about Snapchat at the moment. You've got these filters where you have these silly hats. That will be in your eyes. So you'll have real-time Photoshop for your eyes. And what are you going to do with it? You won't just decide what you're going to wear in the morning. You'll decide how you want to see the world. And because you'll have a 3D model of everything in front of you automatically made, you'll be able to delete things in the scene that you don't like. For instance, if you don't like men, you'll be able to delete them and you'll have a little sign, or you could turn them into monkeys, or whatever it is you want to do. So this is the kind of thing that's happening, and it's coming soon. So just be aware of it. This is what's going to happen. We're going to create reality. We're turning, we're turning reality into a medium, where it becomes a collection of 3D models, where we can infinitely play around with it. And yeah, you get the idea. So in Japan, I've, I've worked in the cyber labs at Tokyo University and Keio Universities. And they're doing things like using augmented reality in the same way I'm talking about, to change the, the size of your food as you eat it, to trick the brain into thinking that you've eaten more or less than you actually have. So for instance, if you're anorexic, obviously you want to you make the food a lot, um, a lot smaller. So also in Japan, they found out that things are less heavy perceptually if they're white. So you go into the gym, everything's, all the dumbbells are black. So they use augmented reality to make everything white. And actually, you can then pull more weight. 
They've got hard science on that. So what, what, what are the implications of these, these contact lenses, these glasses that we're going to be wearing? One of them is that we'll be back in the world. We won't be behind our mobile phone screens. Um, we will return to the body. Fantastic. But also, we will have photographs taken of every single second of our lives. So we won't be able to forget. I don't know if you've seen that Black Mirror episode when that couple are arguing, and one's going, oh, you said that, and they say, no, you said that, and then they're going, let's have a look. So, you know, the only reason we don't kill each other is because we're able to forget things. So what's going to happen when we can't? <laughs> so also this idea of a new visual system, uh, macroscopic vision, where we can see our local view and our overview at the same time. What are the implications for that? Having this double consciousness, and I'm looking at all sorts of different examples. Look at the Aborigines. Um, they actually have this in their art, that they can see macroscopically. They can see mysteriously, like from above. How are they getting that viewpoint? These are footballers playing from the bird's eye view. So they're using virtual reality. <laughs> That's their view. And you can see it doesn't really work. So we all know that the best, <laughs> the best footballers play from the stand and the, and the pitch at the same time. They have those two views. They have double consciousness. These guys don't. <laughs> so let's move on to the second part. So I'm really interested in this idea of post-humanism or hyperhumanism, and that is deconstructing the human system, understanding that the human condition is not fixed, that it's an open notion, which allows for altered traits, not just altered states. So I'm really interested in re-engineering the human, because we very much need to do so, um, and create persistence, changes that are persistent and not just tricks. So some of the defining aspects of this idea of hyperhumanism, um, it's not one, but many types of human that evolve or that reveal themselves, or types of self. And we'll talk a few, a, a, across a few of those. Um, humans are no longer seen as the most important species, and that's absolutely crucial. We're incredibly arrogant to think that we're the only important thing when we're just one point zip, sorry, point one of the meat space in, in the world, but actually we've destroyed 80% of everything else. Everything else. So how do we fix that? And we do that by realizing that we're, we're a lot less important than we thought we were. Um, and thirdly, um, allows us to see existence in interconnected ways, in a more non-dual, so installing the non-dual operating system. So this is the difference between transhumanism and hyperhumanism. This is the North Sense chip that enables you to actually, every time you face North, it just vibrates, and you get a new sense after a few minutes, um, and you wear it permanently. So this is transhumanism. This is Cyborg Nest, and Cyborg Nest's tagline is, we don't want to wear technology, we want to become technology. My point with hyperhumanism is that we want to wear technology maybe for a short period of time. So this is a six-week or eight-week uh, belt that you wear. It gives you the same sense, but then you take the device off, and you have that as a new sense. So again, not, not using technology to become a crutch, but to actually use technology in order to actually create an innate skill or, or reveal some innate ability that we may have had. Think about the stabilizers on your bike that you, you once used to get to learn how to cycle, but then you remove the stabilizers. This is what hyperhumanism is about. So not one, but many types of human. This is uh, transcranial stimulation. If we stimulate the left uh, angular gyrus, we create this sort of presence behind us. If we uh, stimulate the right, we create an out-of-body experience quite reliably. The materialists love this. I think that um, it still doesn't prove materialism. But um, you look at Persinger's helmet. This is actually fascinating because we've got this ability to do dream hacking now by wearing a small cap. This is the one designed in the 60s. Don't expect you to wear this in bed. But a small cap that will give you a small amount of transcranial stimulation during REM will reliably create a lucid dream state. What are we going to do if we can all lucid dream regularly? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to read all the articles that I can't read in, in, in my normal life. I'll scan them before I go to sleep, and then I'll be able to read them at length. What a terrible idea. Um, or, this, or this idea of uh, programmable synthetic hallucinations from MIT, where they're actually using transcranial stimulation to create visual hallucinations in front of your eyes just by stimulating your brain. Or this 
where we're able to use the brain waves directly to, to create VR content. So another, that's a sort of a digital form of lucid dreaming. This is a Nirvana headset that stimulates the vagus nerve as you're actually listening to music. So music as a whole is transformed by one piece of hardware because it stimulates the vagus nerve, the transcranial stimulation. This is Moon Rebus, the other half of Cyborg Nest. Um, and she's got a prosthetic device that basically shakes every time the, um, there's an earthquake in the world. So she's got a direct sense of the, of the earth that no one else has. What's it like to see through others? Mark Farid's going to wear uh, somebody's view. He's going to look through somebody else's eyes and listen to somebody else's hearing for a whole month because he wants to see how concrete the personality is. We all know it's a story that we tell ourselves. He's going to test it. This is in Japan where you can actually become a robot. Kathleen would hate this. So you know, you're inside a smart glasses and a smart gloves, and you basically look down at your body. You've got a robot's body. You look to your right. You're sitting next to yourself. It's incredibly powerful. Uh, body swapping, gender swapping. We can get inside a schizophrenic's mind. Um, this is about not, you know, no longer being in, uh, the, the most prominent species. What's it like to get inside uh, another species' context? So we can have hammerhead vision. We can have insect vision. What's it like to have compound eyes? There's a whole history of what's it like to be a bat in philosophy. Um, but now we can actually create echolocation directly on our senses. So think about virtual reality as a, media, a mediated experience. Now we can actually do this kind of stuff, which actually means we get echolocation as a new sense. What about chickens, where we can actually have VR for chickens? Is it cruel? Is it worse than being stuck in a horrible shed when they can be on a trackball and actually experience what they think is the outside world? It is the matrix, but ultimately it's like, is it cruel? I mean, is it worse? I don't know. But we don't want to go down the Black Mirror route. We want nature to fight back, fight the drones. Uh, this fish is actually like navigating itself around the world. Um, this, we're actually like giving this fish like, you know, a, a, a new sense. This is a tree stump and a fingerprint. We're not just alone in this world. So finally, non-duality. In order to actually understand what I mean by non-duality, just imagine that we, we think we're sitting inside a room, but actually the room is sitting inside us. You can't be an individual wave on the ocean without being the entire ocean. And just my final slide, this stacking idea of technologies. So we're not just looking at you know, digital tech. We're not just looking at senses. Maybe we need to look beyond the senses uh, to, to experience the great unity, invisible, inaudible, intangible. Thank you very much. Carl Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you, Etienne.